celebrating 12 years of possibility. Pilot Flying J and Halloran Hilton Hill present Anything is Possible. Today's guest, Nkeki Njanaku. This is Anything is Possible. I'm Halloran Hilton Hill. And these are great stories about great people who prove with their lives that anything is possible. And if you're just joining us today, this is your first time. If you've seen us in the past, we normally were at a large round oak table and we now have, thanks to our friends at Nouveau Classics, this beautiful set. So I wanna welcome you into my living room now. I, I love what I do. I was telling you and KK about just this desire to tell great stories about great people and to shine the spotlight on possibility because I want to grow more possibility. Mm -hmm. And I realize that those of you watching, uh, if you engage your possibility, if you activate that dream that you have, we're really all going to be blessed by that. Um, when you do what you were uniquely created to do, we all get blessed from that. And today you're going to meet another incredible person and hear another incredible story. This is NKK Ajanaku. Did I pronounce it Absolutely correctly? Absolutely, you did. Let's start with the name. <laughs> NKK Ajanaku. Would you please explain that name? <laughs> well, um, NKK Ajanaku. NKK is a Yoruba. No, well, let me start all over. NKK Ajanaku. NKK is Ibu from Nigeria. And Ajanaku is Yoruba from the country of Nigeria. And Keki means loyal, and Ajanaku means like free people, but it also means elephant. So when you, you, you know, you look at that and you study like the elephant, I love them, <laughs> of course. But, uh, but Ajanaku is a really old name. How did you get this name? Well, I was um, 18 and searching, still searching. For myself, and uh, I, I was by the time I was 13, 12 or 13, I had read the autobiography of Malcolm X and was convicted, you know, that I needed to change my name. And um, just in my whole search for self and freedom, you know, in those days, right. late 60s, early 70s, but early 70s for me. So I changed it. I started changing it. I started looking for the name that was me. Met a group of people in Detroit, um, as a matter of fact. and. Um, was given the name in Keiki because I in, it means loyal. My second name is Kianga, means sunshine, and Ajanaku was the um, the surname. Now, when you go about to change your name, right? I, I just wonder about just that whole process because it's more than a name. It's you self-defining. Yes. It's you saying, I've searched. This is how I want to call myself. Absolutely. Loyal sunshine. And then what about the elephant was? It means free people or the elephant. Just all the things when you think and meditate on the great elephant entity, it means that it's strong, it's strong, solid, long memory, absolutely dedicated to family. So it's, you know, everything that you can think about that great entity of the elephant. So you self-describe with this name, <clears throat> but what happens when you decide to change your name? What does Mama Nim say. <laughs> <laughs> and many people in the early 70s and many in the middle 70s went through that dynamic. And of course, I was watching and was kind of scared about it. And I was, I, I officially, I was in Memphis, Tennessee, and I officially, in those days, you had to go to court right. to change. And um, I officially changed it when I was 19. I wanted, I, I didn't have children then, but I did want to have the name changed and everything taken care of before I started having children. But Blessedly so, my mother was um, an artist. She was so free thinking. She taught me how to read when I was four, prolifically. Her, so I'm saying that she was so broad, she never, never had an attitude about it. When I was able to talk to her about it and tell her where my heart was and where I was going, she was not offended. She didn't take it personally, like, you know, some mothers were, right. I named you and that'll be you. Right, right, right. <laughs> but my mother gave me such strength because I always thought if my mother can accept it and honor me and respect me and call me by my African name, I had no more worries in the world. So my I, mother. I, I can't even begin to imagine how powerful it was for you not to have resistance, but rather support 
in changing your name yes, for now, her to call you that name. That's right. My, now, my grandmother and, and other folk you know, in my family, they still called me, you know. But, you know, it never bothered me because I had that, 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 that support from my mom. You know, my mom left here. She died in 92, and she called me in Keiki, you know, so. What else can you ask for? Wow, and, and when, you, when you even think about her, you just light up. Yes, you, I do. That sunshine comes. Yes. I want you to hold it there because I have a, a question to ask you when we come back. This is my guest in KK, Ajana Koo, and we will be back with more Anything is Possible right after this. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up, in the course of 25 years, it has been important that I had political savvy. It has been absolutely important. And when you need to pull those things out the hat, you need to know what you're doing. This is Anything is Possible. I'm Haller and Hilton Hill. We've got some great sponsors like Pilot and Covenant and, of course, Home Federal. And we thank you for joining us today. My guest is N.K.K. Ajanaku. When you were telling me about the origin of your name, and, and I wanted to start there with your story, you said, Okay, my grandmother, my aunts, they still call me. And when you got to that name, you seized up. You wouldn't say it. No. <laughs> because, you know, I don't, I, it's gone. I've been, I changed my name when I was 19 years old. I'm 57. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, my children even don't really know that name. You know, of course they know. But, you know, I, I was so disassociated from it, from, from really from I was, the time I was 13. I was ready to get rid of it, you know. Why were you so ready to get rid of that name? Because, you know, my studies, you know, and that whole search about who are we as a people here in the United States, and that's African Americans. It was a slave name. And, you know, I respect folk, you know, whatever your name is, you know, because I want to look at the humanity in you, but it was very important for me to, in my search to what, in fact, trying to find out what freedom is. And um, after, again, after reading um, the article by Malcolm X by Alex Haley, right. <laughs> um, it struck a real strong note in my heart. And um, I understood the concept, you know, even though, you know, what he was, he was getting at so clearly then, and I was just determined. So this name is kind of uh, the way you staked your claim to freedom. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about where'd you grow up? I grew up in Gary, Indiana. The home of Michael Jackson Absolutely. and the Jacksons. <laughs> I was rapping with your producer, Chris, <laughs> about, you know, little stories about that. Yeah, but the home, and, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, we, when he was, they were forming their band, my brother was in a band around the same time, and they were very popular, the, his band was in Gary. But we all got a chance to work with, got, with each other. In a Do you sing? I sing. I haven't, you know, just don't sing, sing, but I do sing. I do sing. Um, my mother was a, a classical pianist, so we always had the music and the song and, you know. So your home was filled with the arts because you mentioned in our last segment that your mother gave you this love for reading. Yes. This deep love for reading. Deep she, love. You know, I was reading an article a couple of weeks ago and they said probably the most powerful thing you can do for your children is read to them aloud. Yes. Did she do that with you? She did. She so you, did. So she unleashed your 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 freedom, if you will, because you can go anywhere in the world through reading. But then on top of that, your home is filled with music yes. and art and culture. Yes. Uh, so it makes sense that you would be in the service of music and art and culture here. Yeah, we would go to sleep listening to Edgar Allan Poe's. She would go. We would go to the library, and Mom would, you know, get records. Um, from the library, so we went to sleep looking at, listening to Edgar Allan Poe. I know the story of Macbeth <laughs> back and forth, but that's how, you know, just the little things that she, we didn't have televisions a lot back then, you remember, I don't know if you're old as me, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm saying that it was though she filled our lives, you know, with, with games that she created through the arts. We would act out on Henry plays. <laughs> he would say that that's what so, she did. So here you are with music, you're doing <coughs> plays, you, your life is full of the arts. How do you end up here, though, in Knoxville? How do you end up as the executive director of mm. African American Appalachian Arts? How do you end up as one of the curators of, protectors of, <laughs> founders of putting that huge statue of <laughs> Alex Haley? How does she end up here doing right. this? I, uh, 
When I left Gary, I went to um, Detroit for a little while with some relatives, went to Memphis. I lived in Memphis about 10 years and joined a, um, a cultural movement down there and um, really worked, you know, on honing my skills and community organizing, speaking with folk, building relationships, you know, just, just a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, a lot of work I did in Memphis. When it was time for me to go, I uh, met Pete Drew, <laughs> you know, and I was working with the Republican National Committee. <laughs> <laughs> that makes you laugh, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. And Pete had switched parties. Right. And um, the guy, you know, that I was working with, he, he asked that I would start talking with him, you know, just on how that could be benefit him, you know. Because right. I didn't have any judgments about that, right. So I'm saying that that's how I found about Knoxville. And so so you were working in politics. Oh, I love politics. Really? Yes. So why haven't, or have you run for office? I don't want to run for office. Wait, okay, let's back it up. You just said, oh, I love politics. Oh, I love the strategy, and, the and you, tactic, and the... And, and the, you and put some neck into it, but then I said, why, why haven't you run for office? Well, and like, oh, don't no. get it twisted. <laughs> right, right. So why haven't you run for office? You know, uh, I think because I'm a more of a... Um, and, and I've always thought in the back of my mind, if I took a political seat, it would have to be a groundswell from the community to ask me and demand that I do so. You cut your teeth in politics mm -hmm. uh, by way of Memphis. By way of Gary, Richard Hatcher. Gary, Hattrick, Richard Hatcher. That's right, Richard Hatcher. <laughs> oh. And you were right there next to Chicago. Oh, that's right. So you saw it all. So. Wait a minute, Cleveland Stokes. That's right. Let's go ahead. All right, so, so, but you come, you end up in Knoxville, you work with Pete Drew, but you end up with African American Appalachian Arts, mm -hmm. you, and that is not a political organization. No, it's that not. is a cultural organization. Although we had to be, if you, and that's why I've tried to te teach people in nonprofits and arts. You think you know this is this, but when you, I feel, when you're developing money, when you're seeking resources, you're seeking to make, you know, you you have to be savvy, or at least conscious in every arena that it impacts, you know, your life and the development of whatever, right? So I'm saying that in the course of 25 years, and we've been doing this now, in the course of 25 years, it has been important that I had political savvy. It has been absolutely important. And when you need to pull those things out the hat, you need to know what you're doing. Tell me about uh, African American Appalachian arts. And look at you, I mean, you just started. To <laughs> Again. <laughs> this goes that sunshine. <laughs> the, um, you know, we started the festival in 1989. The Kaumba Festival. The Kaumba Festival. Right. And, um, and it, was, it was built out of a need that we felt, you know, we need to have this entity, you know, this celebration entity, but this arts entity in our community in here in Knoxville. And we were a committee of about 15 people. And so from that, you know, we built our own stages the first year. And we, when we put up the first festival, we called it the uh, African American Appalachian, <coughs> excuse me, African American Appalachian Arts Exposition. Right. So we put it up, and we saw it that first year. We said, "Oh God, this is a festival!" <laughs> so we immediately changed the name, and made the organization African American Appalachian Arts, and you know, and grew it from there. Right. So it just started growing. The first year, we built our own stages. You know, it was just like hardcore, <laughs> backbreaking work. But I think in 25 years, the Kumba Festival has become its own entity. I call it a she. I say she knows how to get up by herself, don't, you know? Because when you start it, it's, it's, it's at the point that we can be institutionalized, you know? So it's, it could go either way. She could die or she could keep living and, and we keep screwing those foundations down, for, you know, for ourselves and for our children and grandchildren. So that's what is an entity today. And everybody, it's something there for everybody. If it's just being exposed and learning, but most certainly, um, talking about the grassroots and having that community base, through our children, we have that today mm. with African American Appalachian Arts, and especially with the uh, Kaumba Festival. Uh, the children in the community said that we want to learn African dance and drum. We used to bring in dance companies and that type of thing for about two or three years. And we also always conducted you know, classes right. and workshops for the kids. So the children start saying, hey, you know, we can do this. We can do this. And they prove themselves right. So now we have um, our Kumba Watoto Urban, you know, Urban Youth Institute, which uh, we run the Kumba camp every year for about three or four weeks prior to the festival. It's a training and performance camp. All right, I want to take another break. When we come back, I have another big question sure. for you. And I want you to take on the role of teacher. Oh, absolutely, sir. All right, you're watching Anything is Possible. We'll be back. Mm -hmm.
Coming up. Who says that you cannot be yourself? You know, who says that? And why, you know, why would you have to conform, you know, for success and whatever the success is, right? Success, I feel, is happiness, love, and peace in your home and, you know, to the best in your ability in the world. This week's Home Federal Community Spotlight is on Emerald Youth Foundation. Did you know that each year Emerald Youth Foundation serves more than 1,300 urban Knoxville children, teens, and youth? To learn more and see how you could get involved, visit emeraldyouth.org. And KK Ajanik, who is with us today on Anything is Possible, I'm glad you changed your name. I don't even know who she is. I just know when you got ready to say that name, you're like, I'm not saying that name. <laughs> I don't even know air. her. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Um, Let's talk about the Alex Haley statue. Yes. I remember when it was uh, oh. installed. That mm -hmm. was a really big day. It was. How did you get Fabulous. the uh, idea to do it? Who did it? And I know you guys went through great travail you know. to see that come to fruition. It, but he's there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Yvonne and he's reading to the children. Fabulous. Yeah. Yvonne Easley. You remember Yvonne? I remember Yvonne. She was, um, when Alex passed, you know, he used to bring Yvonne, you know, she was a jazz singer too, up to, to perform at the farm all the time. Right. So she developed a pretty good relationship with him. I uh, had met him a couple, on a couple occasions, really in Memphis, and then he, when I got here, got a chance to spend some time with him. As a matter of fact, he was, he was editing a friend's business plan, so we were up all night, you know, working with him. So he was so cool. But anyway, when he passed, um, you know, that they had to auction off his stuff and that whole incident that yeah. happened. You know, we didn't want to, um, she was so passionate that she didn't want him to go out like that here in East Tennessee. So um, she she came to me with this idea, you know, we linked arms and hearts about it. If we're going to leave this memorial in East Tennessee about him, we could do a statue. We started from a man-sized statue. Um, we met, we started researching, we met Tina Allen. She was originally from really? Alabama. She was like, man size, let's bring that bad boy up, you know? <laughs> so, so how big is it? And by the way, it said at, it's at Morningside so, Park. Mm -hmm, it's Haley Heritage Square, around the corner of um, Hazen and um, Dandridge. Right. <clears throat> so um, it's 13 feet sitting. If he was to stand, he would be 17 feet. So he's 13 feet sitting. Um, no other details that Tina did, you know, she traveled to Ethiopia because it was just in her head to set his head the way the Sphinx head was set. Wow. So she went over there, you know, and Paul Tina, you know, she's passed, but she was sick and that type of stuff then, but she forced herself, she went over. She said she just stared and, you know, climbed over. She was something else. She wanted to sit that head, you know, the way the Sphinx well, uh, head Let set. me publicly thank you for seeing that through and oh, for leaving that legacy. Thank you. Let me ask you this, uh, before we wrap up, I love this conversation. What was in your life the greatest impossibility that you turned into a possibility? To live, my, live life as myself. For instance, when I came to um, Knoxville, people told me that I would have to cut my hair, that I have to change my name back. If you're going to do anything here in Knoxville, you know, and that's just a for instance. So all my life it's been, you know, just trying to, um, to do the don't. You know, when people say that you don't, and I know that it's possible, and you know, I feel under the, the realm of the sun and the universe, under God's good earth, he says anything is possible. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And trying to act and live that out. So that would be just a challenge for me. You know, who says that you cannot be yourself? You know, who says that? And why, you know, why would you have to conform, you know, for success and whatever the success is, right? Success, I feel, is happiness, love, and peace in your home. and you know, to the best in your ability in the world. So those, those so but people would say, an obstacle, that's a challenge for me, you know. So it, 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 I just do little things like that, too. It's, if you say no, at least I'm going to look. <laughs> to say, is that really a no? Right, right, right. <laughs> you know? Mom should have never taught you how to read. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to look it up. That's absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to see if it's true. And I tell people today, in 2014, you can search anything. You know, to say that I don't know, I can't get this information, today is ludicrous, right? Mm. You just pick up the phone. I do it all the time. Google search and Bing and there is my friend. <laughs> you, know, it, you can ask any question today and get some type of answer, at least a stimulant for you to find out, you know. Tell me about your children. I have four children. 
I have two girls and two boys, Bolanile, Obanyana, Takia, and Toromari. I have, um, and they're just wonderful. They've been with poor mommy and dragging them along. And they're basically artists too. That's gratifying for me. They're, my son teaches with Knox County Schools. My daughter, she has uh, four sons, you know, in Nashville, Tennessee. They have a transportation business there. Um, you know, it's just beautiful. I have six grandsons and one granddaughter. So life is very fulfilling for me, you know, so. Well, you know what, I, I'm so glad that you saw the possibility in your name and thus the possibility in your life. Give me one rule for the road, one rule for those seeking possibility before we get away. Well, one thing is what we started talking about, find the good and praise it. I think that we need to make a commitment here in Knoxville and Knox County to do that. I think that sometimes we so, and that's people period, we immediately grab on to the negative, you know, and, and dissect it and, and throw it out and, you know, and go, go all the way up the road. But do it take the little time, just to take the 30 seconds, find something at the end of the day, you know, to praise about you. You know, I can, I can freely say I admire, love, and respect you, Halloran. You've always been there for me as far as promoting, you know, whatever I'm doing and we're doing. So I say thank you. You know, you see what I'm saying? That Absolutely. it's not a hard thing to do. You're not, you want weak as a result of praising folk. Sing your song. I sing God's song. I sing your song. I love to do that more than I sing my own song. So, wow. That's what well, I say. Well, thank you for being a, a great expression of, possi expression of possibility. And I love and appreciate you. And I thank you for all that you give to our community. Thank uh, you. you are a representation of that. And it's my honor to have you here today. Thank you, Helen. We'll see you next time on Anything Is Possible. Yeah, that's good. <laughs>